Chapter 41, Philosophy. My car emerged from the mouth of Logan Canyon at 3 a.m. I drove through town to my apartment feeling like a stranger. Nothing had changed here in the few days of my absence, but I had. Everything from the buildings to the shape of the hills felt different, though what I really felt was the contrast between my new self and the old one brought to memory by these familiar sights. I set my alarm and woke up four hours later for class, but 8 o'clock found me standing in the registration line instead of walking toward philosophy class with Ski and Ben. I dropped the class and signed up for French 1010 instead, then walked to Old Main and my new class. I was surprised to notice that I didn't miss Netta terribly. Instead, a warm feeling of satisfaction filled me, and I felt truly happy and optimistic about the future. I found the classroom a few minutes early and sat down near the back. Three minutes later, Julie walked through the door. Bonjour, she said enthusiastically. I didn't know you were taking French. I was surprised to see her and even more surprised by how happy she seemed to see me. Things must be going really well with Ski. I just added it, I told her. What made you decide to add, she asked with a happy grin, sitting down in the desk next to me. You never know when you might decide to move to France. That sounds so fun, Julie said, reaching over to touch my hand. Don't you leave me behind when you go. Her bright blue eyes sparkled as she flashed her perfect smile. I had the distinct impression that her smile meant something more than just a friendly hello. I again felt surprised and confused. Did you see Ski much over the break? I asked. Oh, yes. He's so funny. Bonjour, mes étudiants, the professor said, walking in. Je m'appelle Madame Freck. Bienvenue à Français Mille D. When class ended, I could ask your name in French, comment vous appelez-vous, and answer the same question, je m'appelle Spencer. When are we going skiing again, Julie asked as we gathered up our notes and stuffed them in the syllabus into our packs. I brought my skis up from home. How about tomorrow afternoon, I asked. Getting busy with friends right away, like Annette suggested, would help me not miss her as much. And I could find out why on earth Julie suddenly seemed so happy to see me. Sounds great, Julie said. I'll even cook you dinner afterward. She stood up then and left the room, flashing another happy smile as she walked out the door. Looks like you've got it made, said the guy who sat opposite Julie, the envy showing in his eyes. Yeah, I guess, I answered. I stopped by a computer lab during my hour break between classes and wrote Netta an email. I told her that I got home safely, that I signed up for French, and that I loved her and missed her. I thought about mentioning Julie, but decided not to. Julie wasn't an issue. I wasn't interested in her anymore, not now that I had Annetta. I walked back to the student center to wait for my next class. The sunburst lounge was full of soft couches and large windows looking out on the snow-covered campus and nearby mountains. I sat down, closed my eyes, and leaned back into the couch as warm sunshine broke through the clouds and shone in through the glass. Spencer, buddy, where you been? Ski shouted as he plopped down on the couch next to me. I didn't see it in class. I dropped it, I said. It was good to see him. And added French. No kidding. Well, I have some very good news for you. What's that? I asked, already guessing. Julie's taking French, he said, bobbing his eyebrows up and down, and she's anxious to get her hands on you. Now you can study together. Why? What do you mean, why? So you can get to know her, you know, impress her, take her out, all that. I mean, why is she so interested in me all of a sudden? Oh, it's not all of a sudden, Ski assured me. I've been building you up all through the break. She thinks of you as some kind of hero now. Ski laughed like that was the funniest thing he had ever heard. And she knows you're crazy about her. Don't you let me down now. Don't you make me look like a liar. Ski took a moment to look extremely pleased with himself, then noted the irony about him being a liar most of the time and laughed out loud again. Merry Christmas, he added meaningfully. I suddenly remembered the last time he had said that as we all separated for Christmas break and finally understood what he had meant, what he had planned all along. I thought she was only interested in you, I said, wondering how he had managed to change her focus so completely. It's like I told you, he explained. I don't think I could go for the perfect type. Well, I reasoned to myself, since Julia's interest in me is all built on lies, it won't last. I would enjoy her company while I could and practice seeming confident for as long as I could manage. 
I observed how my low expectations made it even easier to not feel so nervous about talking with her. Why'd you drop philosophy anyway? Ski asked. I met this girl, I began to answer, and, hey guys, it was Ben, huffing and puffing. He plopped down on the couch next to Ski. Man, you walk fast, he said. Not fast enough, Ski retorted. Ben ignored the slam. Where were you this morning, Ben asked. We saved you a seat. I saved you a seat, Ski corrected, and Ben sat in it and saved you the next one. I dropped the class, I said. Why? asked Ben, looking surprised and disappointed. So he wouldn't have to see you any more than absolutely necessary, Ski answered, and he met some girl. I thought he liked Julie. He does. Now shut up and let him talk, Ski commanded. Now tell us why this girl made you drop the class. I thought you were going to be a philosophy major. I changed my mind, I said. I sort of found the meaning of life. Whoo, the meaning of life, eh? Well, you're a bit late. Ski opened his backpack and pulled out my philosophy paper. I picked it up for you, he said. A large red C plus was scrawled across the top. You're not going to be a philosopher, Ben asked. You're certainly not going to be a philosopher, Ski told Ben, pointing an accusing finger and then drawing it back and looking at his fingertip as if it had been contaminated. What do you mean, Ben asked, obviously hurt. Yes, I will. I already... A lover of knowledge, Ski scoffed. All you love is to hear yourself talk. That makes you a philosopher, not exactly the same thing. This silenced Ben long enough for Ski to turn back to me. And you think a girl is the meaning of life? You're beginning to sound a lot like Adam. Oh, it's not her, I corrected. It's something she said. What makes the difference and brings meaning to life is to act with courage and love. Ski and Ben just looked at each other. And you bought that? Ski asked after a pause. Listen, I said, it makes a lot of sense when you think about it. Are you sure you've thought about it? Ski asked. You think that that's better than doing what you want and being great? Yeah, I answered. I do. And anyway, just doing what you want isn't enough to make you great. Look at Ben. He does what he wants, right? Do you think he's great? Good point, Ski said with relish, enjoying the renewed offended look on Ben's face. Don't worry, Ben, I said. We know you have your redeeming qualities. Ski's smile faded and he looked disappointed in me for making the concession. Anyway, Ski, Ben said, you're not looking very tan. I know you didn't go to Mexico, so don't tell me you always do everything you want. A regular Sherlock Holmes we have here, Ski retorted. But you missed one important clue, Inspector. Did I ever say I was great? No, I didn't, so shut up. Both of you shut up, I interrupted. The idea is, I continued, that if you have courage and love on the inside, then greatness follows on the outside. Get it? Well, if that's your argument, Ski pointed out, then what you're saying is that greatness is the meaning of life and that courage and love are simply means of attaining it. Except that if greatness is the meaning of life, then no one can experience meaning until after they become great. Love and courage create meaning instantly. Hmm, Ski said thoughtfully. He smiled broadly, and I could tell he found our conversation invigorating and satisfying. It didn't take him long to find his next plan of attack. I'm disappointed in you, Spencer, Ski said. You meet some girl who twists your brain and suddenly you're willing to throw your entire education to one side for one simple, cheesy idea. What? I asked, getting drawn deeper into the debate. You think education's about memorizing facts and ideas? I thought it was about learning to use your own brain. Okay, okay, Ski backed off. But really, didn't you study last semester? Didn't you learn anything of any value to you now? Sometimes academia makes you lose sight of the real things in life, I answered. We were never meant to base our entire existence on logic alone, you know. You haven't answered my question, Ski said. Are you really going to toss your entire education? Just think about it. There are probably lots of loving, courageous idiots out there. Think of Don Quixote. Talk about courage. But did that make him accomplish anything great? No, he just ran around and got into all sorts of trouble. And Ski ended here, shaking his head. Well, Ben started in, if you'll remember what Sartre said. Ben, will you shut up? Ski nearly shouted. We're trying to have a discussion here. Let him talk, I said. But Ben, you'd better not be talking just to show off. Ben stopped then, looking back and forth at Ski and I. Never mind, he finally said, speechless for the first time since I met him. Then came Ski's turn to look back and forth between us. Was that an example of courage and love? He asked. Did you actually silence the philosopher? Maybe you've got a point after all. I suppose you're right about the education thing, I conceded. So what would you call it? Wisdom, Ski answered. Courage, love, and wisdom. And that makes it complete, I asked.
Ski looked down and thought for a moment. Sure, he answered. Whatever. Chapter 42. Full Circle It turned out that Julie lived just a few blocks from Ben and me. I picked her up the next afternoon and we drove to the mouth of Green Canyon. We parked the car and clicked into our skis, then started up the snow-covered road. We slid forward on one ski, then the other, pushing forward with our long poles and gliding up the trail. How was your vacation? I asked. Julie told me about going home to Oregon to see her family for a few days and about all the fun things she had done with ski once she returned. Why didn't you tell me you're an honorary member of Search and Rescue? She asked. So that's what Ski told her, I thought. I may as well clear this up right now. Listen, Julie, I began. You can't believe everything Ski tells you. Julie nodded knowingly, almost smugly, yet approvingly. Her expression looked as if she knew something I didn't. What's that look for? I asked. Ski told me you'd probably deny everything and about how modest you are. I laughed out loud and shook my head, admiring Ski's expertise in weaving his web of lies. Even from miles away, he was winning this game. When Julie asked about my vacation, I told her about my grandma's house, my family, and Netta. We hit it off really well, I said, making it as clear as possible that I wasn't available for another relationship. I've never met anyone quite like her. How long will she be gone? Julie asked. Three years, maybe, I answered. But I'm planning to visit her in France this summer, and we'll see where it goes from there. Julie nodded. There, I thought. That should clarify everything. Not that I needed to worry about Julie staying interested in me anyway. As soon as she got to know me better, all of Ski's flattering lies would wear thin and she would see me for who I really was. Until then, I would practice my new confidence on her. I would get to know Julie and perhaps when she lost interest, we could stay friends. Julie seemed smart and fun and interesting and I certainly wouldn't mind keeping a friend like that. Three miles later, the trail flattened out and we slid to a stop in a tiny meadow. I recognized the clearing as the spot where I had prayed for answers and miracles during finals week. My prayers had been answered far beyond anything I could have imagined. Tall pines and leafless white aspen trunks hemmed in the snowy meadow. Bright sunshine poured down through a clear blue sky and made the snow sparkle all around us. I felt good. I felt present and awake, neither tied to the past nor worried about the future. I felt so alive, and a thrill ran all the way down to my toes. That's the meaning of life, isn't it? I thought to myself, to just feel alive. It's so beautiful, Julie whispered under her breath. I turned to her and nodded. I thought you'd like it. I glanced up at the sky and noticed a single high, faint cloud. When I was young, I used to lay on the grass after school, staring up at the sky, looking for something above the high clouds, trying to see God up there, trying to sense him looking down at me. I always pictured him sort of like my grandpa, only with a flowing white beard and a sort of patient longing in his expression. Dear God, I thought to myself, I know you can hear me. Thanks so much for everything. It's wonderful. In Jesus' name, amen. I peered up for a moment longer, watching for some indication that my prayer had reached heaven, then looked down to catch Julie watching my face. Julie clicked out of her ski bindings and sank five inches deeper into the snow. She stepped toward me and looked up at me with her bright blue eyes sparkling in the sunlight. A drop of sweat ran down my cheek and stopped on my chin, and Julie reached out a gloved hand and wiped the drop away, one corner of her mouth turning up in a faint smile. I smiled back at her then gazed around at the snow-covered mountainsides, tall trees, and bluebird sky. Isn't life beautiful? I asked. Very, Julie agreed. The End And thank you for listening to Courage, Love, and the Meaning of Christmas. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you'll continue on to book two, The Perfect Gift, and book three, the end of the trilogy, The Art of Heart, which is my personal favorite. And I hope you love that all. And if you do, 
then thank you for telling your friends about it, maybe sharing your opinion on social media, uh, an Amazon review telling what you liked about it. I think you know that this means a lot to us authors. We really appreciate it when you do that sort of thing. And it also helps us to make the time to do what we love and create more content for you to enjoy. So thanks again, and Merry Christmas to you all. About the author. Sean Roundy earned a Master of Arts degree in English from Utah State University and taught writing there and at Utah Valley University for 15 years. He has published 12 books and many articles and short stories. Sean was born in New Jersey, then moved to Massachusetts, California, and Brazil before settling in the Rocky Mountains in Logan, Utah. Many of the details found in this book were derived from his experiences there and at his uncle's antique mansion in the small town of Oakley, Idaho. He later moved to Spain, Taiwan, China, and Utah Valley, as well as working and traveling in nearly every other state and several countries, including a five-week, 2,500-mile ocean voyage to help a friend sail his boat home from Venezuela. A friend in need is a friend indeed. Sean enjoys spending time in the outdoors, hiking, climbing, mountaineering, camping, skiing, sailing, motorcycling, travel, teaching, learning, and much more. You can enjoy some of his adventures and insights on the University of Life at youoflife.com, as well as his YouTube channels at youtube.com slash Sean Roundy and youtube.com slash Utah Highways. He has volunteered on the Utah County Sheriff's Search and Rescue Team for 20 years, as well as chairing the Mountain Rescue Association's Intermountain Region for more than half that time. He appeared in the Discovery Channel's Raging Planet Blizzards, KUED documentaries, Secrets of the Lost Canyon and Search and Rescue, several feature-length movies. He's been interviewed on NPR's All Things Considered and made many other notable media appearances. Most of all, Sean craves beauty, experience, connection, wisdom, good friends, fun, and adventure, and hopes to share that with everyone around him and make the world a better place.